thing and just tell people, just keep drumming that over and over and over and over again. I had a great leader that used to tell me as a, as a leader, load the pipe, load the pipe, load the pipe. Didn't matter what problem I brought to him, he just kept saying, load the pipe, load the pipe, load the pipe. I learned that recruiting solves a lot of problems, pretty much everything. But that's the key, keeping it simple. Figure out and tell them what lever they need to move in order to drive the business, not 15 or 20 of them. Uh, this is another one, this is a specific one, but I find that when I find it, whether you're leading leaders or advisors, that time that you have dedicated each week, I don't care if it's 15 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, or every two weeks, or every month, whatever, but people need a time where they can sit down with you. I've had leaders say, of course I do one-on-ones, I see people every day, and whatever I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that. But when you actually sit down and do a business review, you're going to get stuff out of that meeting that you wouldn't normally get. And I will tell you, I see leaders that sometimes they skip one-on-ones or they cancel it for a recruiting meeting or something. If you don't show up for a one-on-one, I will tell you, it's one of the power, most powerful messages you can make. You can let somebody know that just without even saying it, that they're not important. And that might be the day they need you the most. Okay, I remember, and this happened in my very first year, I was an intern. For, for somebody at a company that I worked with, and this was my senior year in college, and I was gonna come on full time. I remember that leader, every time I'd go in his office, and he would even call me in there, would be a one-on-one, -on -one. he would never look at me. He would be on his computer, multitasking, just ask me a couple questions, blah, 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 and he'd never make eye contact with me. And here I was, and I, I was 21 years old, I know I wasn't the biggest priority for him, but it affected me. I remember saying, well, I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna work for somebody who doesn't take time to just look at me. <laughs> And that's all I needed to do. I actually transferred to another office and started my career at an office that was an hour and a half away, down in South Jersey. Because of that, that was a big part of it. Okay, that sets a tone. Uh, great leaders play to win. There's a difference between playing to win, what's the opposite of playing to win? It's not playing to lose, but it's playing not to lose. Great leaders teach their team how to win. And I will tell you, one of the best things we did, I took over an organization that was a failing organization about five years ago. I've been working on building that up and turning it around. We've had some terrific, terrific success, especially over the last three years. First couple of years, was kind of breaking it down, putting the foundation in. But I will tell you, you know what the turning point was? We had this little dumb phone contest that we did with some other agencies across the country. And we, didn't, we weren't winning anything, we weren't getting any medals. But you know what? We figured, hey, you know what? Let's really gung all out for this and go for it. And we won it. And all it was, it was just nothing. It was bragging rights, that's all. But I will tell you, it did something amazing. It showed our team, who is not used to winning, that we can win. And I will tell you, I look back on that, that was the turning point. Because then people started to feel like this is really cool. They got a taste of victory, a taste of winning. And you know it's addictive, right? You know how it feels to win. It is addictive. Teach your people how to win. Take something small, show them how to win. And you'll get them wanting to win more and more. You'll get them winning and you create a winning culture and a winning team. It doesn't have to be the big stuff. Start with the small stuff, the easy victories. It's unbelievable and that's playing to win. Inspect what you expect. Okay, top leaders know the importance of that. If you expect people to ask for referrals in a meeting, jump in and observe them. Who's them on there to drill for the drill their skill on the ask process. If you expect them to keep trackers on referrals, inspect it. It's unbelievable at how many times we're really good at laying and setting the expectations, but we don't go back and follow up. Norman Schwarzkopf never would have known there was a problem in the culture of that and the, the actual, uh, uh, you know, the procedures and policies of that troop unless, that, unless he visited that camp, that base. Never would have known, never would have known that. You don't see that unless you inspect it. I'm huge on culture. Because results follow culture. It's not the opposite. When you have a strong culture, that attracts more people. A lot of what we're talking about is all part of building your culture. Building the right culture. Uh, and that starts at the top, no doubt. It's not all about working and working hard, but it's also play and have fun. I encourage you to do that. This business is tough. People need something to look forward to. I always, I'm big on fun. I like to have fun. I look forward, I need things to look forward to. Uh, and, and I just, we, we do goofy things. We're the goofy company that dresses up for Halloween, we really do. 
Uh, it's, it's kind of funny to see people coming in that. We do dodgeball games, we play kickball, we do escape the room adventures, we do um, you know, scavenger hunts. Oh, what is the culture here? Would they be able to say? Would they be able to describe it? Would they be able to say what the vision is for the culture? It also helps you attract great people too. Uh, follow through, this is key. There, I remember a leader that uh, was so good at coming around and he would, he would take these notes and we, we used to call this, it was funny, he would walk around and he would, take, he would ask questions, okay, what's wrong? What do we need to work on? And he was so good at taking these notes and he put it in his black book, but then nothing would ever happen. And we started calling this the black hole notebook. Like it just, it would go in and whoosh, it just was gone. There was nothing there because we never heard any follow-up and never saw any follow-up. What do you think happened to his credibility? <laughs> Went right down, right? So take action, do things. It's unbelievable how, how easy it is to do this and fix this if this is a gap for you. Just be conscious of it. Be conscious, and, and this is a whole other topic I could go on about the competency ladder I'm big on, where you're unconsciously incompetent, you don't even know you're doing it wrong, then you're consciously incompetent. Okay, now I know I'm doing that wrong, I'm not good with follow-up, now I gotta think about it, now I gotta be consciously competent. I gotta think about it, and do it, and then eventually you won't even have to think about it, you're unconsciously competent. You can apply that competency ladder to everything. Okay, follow-through is key. Instilling blind faith. What I see great leaders do, they build this organization where people will just follow them and do whatever. And that's what makes a part of what makes a great leader because there's a trust level there. And there's a respect level there. And they know that that leader is going to lead them in the right direction. What I find fascinating, I don't know if anybody knows the Blue Angels, but uh, if you ever see a documentary on the Blue Angels, these are the fighter jets that fly in formation, type formation. It's beautiful. It's unbelievably impressive to see these live. And if you see this documentary, how they actually train, they sit in a classroom and they sit at a desk and they, they actually close their eyes and they go through the, the maneuvers in their mind. And they, the lead pilot will say, okay, roll left in three, two, one. And they'll just, they'll visualize the whole thing. It's amazing. And then when they go up there and they're flying, they're flying 500 miles an hour, 500 miles an hour. And they're flying in this direction, but the pilot is actually looking over here. They're flying 500 miles in this direction, and the pilot is looking over here, and all they're trying to do is they're trying to keep their wing within about 18 inches of the pilot to their right or their left. That's all they're trying to do. They're listening to the commands, they're flying 500 miles an hour here, they're looking there and they're saying, roll three, two, left, and three, two, one, and then they roll and they do it. That's it. Think about it. That's the epitome of blind faith. But this would not work if they didn't have that, right? What would happen if they were looking straight ahead? It wouldn't work. They'd crash. Okay? That's the element. That's to the level. I actually go through this story with my advisors when they come in. Here's the level of blind faith you have to have. We're going to give you the formula. We're going to tell you exactly how to do this, how to be successful. you got to trust us. If you implement exactly how we tell you to do it, you're going to be successful. Okay? That's the key thing. Next is a DOC everything. What does DOC stand for, by the way? Does anybody know? This is a good one. Demonstrate, observe, confirm. Okay, demonstrate, observe, confirm. Easy way. Anytime you're thinking about, okay, what do I need to train somebody on? They need to see it first. That's where you're demonstrating it. Then they observe, and then you observe them doing it, and then you confirm. If I learn how to be a, a pilot, I'm going to go on the plane. The, pot, the, the flight instructor is going to say, okay, don't touch a thing. I'm going to fly it. You listen, you watch. I'm going to talk you through it. And then after we do a couple flights, maybe you'll touch the controls a little bit. Eventually, you're going to fly the plane. And as the instructor, I'm just going to sit back and watch you do it. I'm not going to do a thing. That's an example of demonstrate, observe, confirm. If you're seeing gaps in implementation, try that. Okay, go back to that uh, demonstrate, observe, confirm. One of the uh, most meaty topics here is situational leadership. We don't have time to go through too much, but I want to just expose you to it briefly. What that really is about is great leaders recognize that there are different leadership styles that you have to employ in order to drive results based on somebody's readiness level. Okay, so let me give you a quick example. If, if your shoe was untied, 
you know, and I went, I, I might just tell you, hey, your shoe's untied. I know you know how to tie your shoe. But if my three-year-old shoe was untied, I might have to go to my three-year-old and tie the shoes and show him or her, okay, here's how you do it. You gotta do the bunny ears, wrap it around, you pull it through. That's a totally different leadership style to get the same result, right? So just think about, first is I've got to understand what is the readiness level of my advisor with that task. And then I have to apply the right leadership for that task. This is a really in-depth topic. I love it, and I wish I had more time to go through it. This is a, uh, a one pager, so I keep something like this a little bit different. On my desk, I have it laminated. Um, and it's a, just a good reference tool for me. So if I'm struggling with somebody, I'll just say, okay, what's their willingness and incentive and security and confidence? There's an acronym that I go by for risk. Um, and it's a great way to drive, to figure out, okay, if I'm trying to get somebody to do something and they're not doing it, why are they not doing it? Well, I'm not applying the right leadership. That's exactly what it is. I've got to change my style. Maybe I've got to be more directive or more coaching or change less relationship, more relationship. Uh, if you would like this, by the way, I'm happy to send you, I've got a cheat sheet on it. Uh, I hope this works because we set it up. Uh, if you text John L to this number, 555-888, I'll send that to you. Uh, it's a great, great tool uh, and a really helpful, just try it, start learn, learning. It's one of these things that takes a long time to learn, but it will take your leadership to the next level, big time. Okay. Um, Leveraging others. This is key. Great leaders recognize the importance. They can't do everything by themselves. I may not be great in a lot of areas that my advisors need help on, but I, my job is to be a resource broker. I've got to pull in the people that are. I've got to surround myself with people that are better than me in other areas that I might be weak at. Okay? Weak leaders tend to surround themselves with people that are just like them. Not the case. Build a strong team. I want different personalities. I want different viewpoints. I want people that have different backgrounds. That's how you get great, great ideas and you really build a winning organization. Great leaders aren't afraid to pull people in. They're also not afraid to develop people. And that's a key element of a top leader. What they do is focus their time on making people better than them. I've had great leaders. I've had great, great leaders that invested in me and I really felt like they truly wanted me to rise up faster than they and become better leaders than they do. The same way I want my leaders to do the same thing. You have to spend the time. We spend time teaching people how, how to ask for referrals. We spend time telling people how to, how to do a first appointment, a closing meeting, everything, and fill out an application. But we don't teach people leadership. Many organizations have this gap. As a leader, ask yourself, how am I investing in the development of my leaders? Okay, I know I went through a lot with you today. And before we open up to questions, I wanna, I wanna close it with a thought. Because there's one more piece of this that's absolutely critical. In order to become the leader that you wanna become. If you wanna drive your business to new heights and you yourself grow to new heights, there's one more thing that it takes. It takes a lot of persistence, it takes a lot of perseverance and resilience, but it also takes a ton of patience. And if you're familiar with the Chinese bamboo tree, Chinese bamboo tree farmers do very, very well. And part of it is that they require, what is required is an immense amount of patience. Because the way the Chinese bamboo tree actually grows is you plant the seeds and then you have to nurture it and water it every single day for four years before anything pops out of the ground. Think about that for a second. Four years every single day before anything pops out of the ground. When it does pop out of the ground, what's pretty amazing is it grows so fast, people say you can almost see it growing, it grows that fast. It grows, whoops, sir. It grows about 90 feet in six weeks. In six weeks. It's unbelievable. But think about this, think about everything that that person had to endure, that farmer, think about all your, the, the, the farmer's relatives, like come in, you know, you, you brought this plot of land and you have all this dirt, you know, and you plant the seeds and they come back after year one and they're like, hey, what are you doing, John? You got like nothing here. No, no, I'm doing, I'm doing this Chinese bamboo tree thing and just give me a little bit of time. Come back, and they come back the next year and they're like, 
What is this? You, you got nothing here. What are you doing? Third year they come back. Fourth year they come back. Like, what are you doing? I mean, think about all the negative influence you have. But it takes patience. Patience. That's what leadership takes. All I'm asking you to take one thing, two things, maybe three things max from what we talked about and work on it. All you're trying to do is find that little 3% difference, that 3% edge. When you figure that out, then go back to it. To my earlier point this morning with tennis, Novak Djokovic went back, he figured out the 3%. Then he went back and he did it again. And he might even be able to go back and do it again. That's how great leaders become great. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.